Hi there, and welcome back to the Beyond Aromatics podcast. I'm your host, Savannah Rose. On today's episode, we'll be chatting with an expert in the clean beauty industry to discuss the intricacies involved with launching your own skincare business. We'll talk the retail side, we'll talk brand management, and we'll even get into some regulations and sourcing issues you might run into. We hope you enjoy the show, and if you do, go ahead and leave us a rating or review, or tell others about it so they can find us too. All right, here's the show. On today's episode, we sit down with special guest Amy Galper. Amy is the founder of the first aromatherapy school in New York City, the New York Institute of Aromatherapy. She has been a certified aromatherapist since 2001, as well as a passionate advocate, entrepreneur, formulator, and consultant in clean beauty and wellness. Amy is honored and proud to be a member of Credo Beauty's Clean Beauty Council, celebrating, advocating, and educating for clean beauty and wellness, along with other influencers and thought leaders in the field. Amy has also appeared as a featured speaker at the Indie Beauty Expo, Women in Flavor and Fragrance Conference, the Jewish Museum of Florida, Eco Sessions, along with dozens of other media events and conferences. She's currently a guest lecturer at New York University, Arbor Vita School of Traditional Herbalism, and has presented at Nova Southeastern University. Amy has also been featured as an essential oils expert in countless news outlets, publications, and podcasts. Amy is co-author of the best-selling natural beauty book, Plant-Powered Beauty. It's the essential oil guide to using natural ingredients for health, wellness, and personal skin care. Including more than 50 recipes, the book is now endorsed by beauty industry visionaries Bobby Brown, Annie Jackson, Sophie Uliano, and Tata Harper. Amy's new book, The Ultimate Guide to Aromatherapy, is available now, and you can find a link to it in the Naha Bookstore. Co-authored with fellow essential oils expert Jade Schutz, the book provides a progressive, comprehensive approach to using aromatherapy and essential oils for healing and wellness. Today, I'm here with Amy Galper, who um, is currently residing in New York City, and um, Amy is going to be speaking with us today about some insights on the skincare industry. So hello, Amy, and thank you for being here. Oh, well, thanks so much for inviting me, Savannah. I'm thrilled to be a guest on the podcast here. So thank you. Yes. And um, I feel like we've been trying to kind of connect for months and you've been in the middle of launching some new things, some doing some exciting projects and, you know, tried to speak to you earlier this summer because I, I feel like um, people love to experiment and learn and really invest in um, the skincare industry. It's such a such a large industry. Um, and I wanted to, you know, get your insights and expertise. And, um, I feel like you should let, you know, our listeners know if they don't already know you kind of where your background was from and, um, what you're doing now. Okay, perfect. So, um, I actually, started my whole journey like in the wellness field, I guess you would call it, um, back in the late 90s. I started out as a shiatsu practitioner where I had my own private practice and I was also an instructor. Um, And really what fueled that interest was my obsession at the time of learning everything I could about mind-body medicine and mind-body connection. And um, a friend of mine at the time had introduced me to a shiatsu therapist and I had had acupuncture, but I had never really experienced shiatsu at the time. And I was really blown away by how um, powerful it was as body work, as far as like really connecting to my own, you know, flow of energy, but also just feeling a real sense of a real deep state of relaxation, which I thought was really amazing. And around the same time that I was um, practicing a uh, shiatsu, another friend introduced me to essential oils. And so I had been very, uh, you know, into the whole mind body thing. And when I took one whiff of an essential oil and it was sandalwood, actually, I still remember it like blew my mind because I really understood in a totally visceral way, what it meant to have a mind body connection. Like, even though the shiatsu 
communicated to me kind of like a deep relaxation state of mind body, but really understanding how emotion, uh, psychological kind of uh, outlook, uh, spirit stuff, energetics, and body all mixed together. It wasn't until I took a sniff of that sandalwood where it all made sense. And then that is kind of how my journey down the rabbit hole started. I um, ended up studying some aromatherapy, got my uh, certificate in that, came uh, back to New York, ended up um, incorporating essential oils into my shiatsu practice. And I realized uh, that a lot of my clients wanted to kind of carry that experience with them outside of the office and the, uh, the session. So I started then creating uh, aromatherapy products for them. Basically, I just made very simple aromatherapy salves based on very simple kind of traditional herbal salve recipes that have been around for hundreds and hundreds of years. And probably every aromatherapist who's listening to this knows how to make one. So I basically <laughs> took that like formula. And then I just added my unique blends of essential oils. And before I even had the name of a brand or anything, my product, everybody wanted my products. And you have to understand this was back in 2003. So it was before Whole Foods kind of hit the world. It was before people Honestly, were really talking. That's yeah. Before like people buy products on social media now where people can do that kind of stuff like that was before that I mean you were doing it before it was cool I guess in the sense <laughs> where it almost seems like you open up a social media account and you just inundated with tons of different types of products for tons of different kinds of things you didn't even know were a problem exactly so this was a whole different world right and it was and you're totally right there was like no social media nothing so I had to go about it like what was the conventional traditional way where you actually like pick up the phone and make a cold call or you <laughs> knock on doors you go to a neighborhood that you like and you walk into every boutique and you ask them if they'd like to see your products it was a whole <laughs> different world you know <laughs> And You're walking around with it in like a suitcase. <laughs> exactly. I was a traveling salesman. Exactly. <laughs> and, um, and I was also uh, making them in my kitchen. I was making these products in my kitchen. And even back then in 2003, I was really committed and dedicated to only using whole plant ingredients. So I was really against like using obviously any fragrance oils or any kind of um, materials like um, emulsifying waxes or anything that had any kind of uh, echo of a petrochemical at all. I was mm. trying to really keep it really clean. And what amazed me was that the yoga community, which I was at that time very immersed in, and those were my primary customers, that although they were eating really healthy and they were practicing yoga and meditation, they would you know, reach into their purses or their yoga bags and pull out things like Vaseline intensive care or, you know, all these other kind of products that were basically like 90% petroleum. And I was mm -hmm. shocked. So I really took it upon myself during those early years to also spend a lot of time educating and kind of advocating for what I've called at the time conscious skincare or conscious beauty. And when I started realizing that people were really interested in this and they really wanted to trust that my products were really what they said they were, I then pursued getting my products um, produced in a factory, like a contract manufacturer facility that also was certified organic. So then my products were able to carry the USDA organic seal. And I was one of the first body care companies back in the early 2000s that actually had the USDA organic seal. And from there on in, it just kind of catapulted me right into, in a way, like the spotlight, the crosshairs of like, what is natural beauty? Like, why do we need to put plant ingredients on our bodies? Why is that important? So although I was selling my products and the brand at that time, the name of my brand was Buddha Nose at the time, and mm -hmm. it saw a wide distribution even globally. And it was really exciting. But I discovered that 
really what I was doing like 90% of the time, even when I went to a sales meeting is I was educating people. What is an essential oil? What is beeswax? Why should I use that rather than emulsifying wax? Why should I use, you know, jojoba oil rather than mineral oil? Why should I use, right? I was explaining all this to all these people. And from there, that then kind of morphed into a consultancy practice because as, um, that uh, as people started to get more interested in like larger brands started like, you know, their ears and their eyebrows started to go up going, hmm, maybe we should pay Mm -hmm. attention. Maybe we shouldn't use fragrance oils. Maybe we should use essential oils. You know, they Mm -hmm. started getting curious about what was going on. And as I'm sure you're aware too, like suddenly New York, you know, back in the early 2000s, in the early 2000s and 2003, there was like maybe three or four yoga studios in all of Manhattan. But by like 2010, there were like dozens and dozens everywhere. So definitely the awareness and the consciousness was being raised and people were becoming much more aware of how what they put on their skin not only impacts their own well-being, but the well-being of the environment and and carries weight on so and has so many other ripples. So I started a consultancy practice around, I would say 2011, where I really started working with established brands and new brands um, to create more, uh, I I would say like cleaner kind of ingredient decks. And then in 2013, just because I had been so inundated by so many questions from people that I was working with as a consultant, um, I opened up the first aromatherapy school in New York City in 2013. And it was called the New York Institute of Aromatherapy. And um, in 2013, we saw, you know, just hundreds and thousands of students come through our door. And one of the things that I did really special here, um, because as I'm sure you're aware, because you work with so many um, uh, educators um, through Naha, is that there were very few places in the country where you could get live classroom experience. Most of the Mm -hmm. programs were all online. So what I was really doing here in New York was really, I was offering like a real school. Like you came to school, Mm -hmm. it was a physical space. You know, you learned together, we blended together. I even did student clinics here where our students got to work with people off the street and, you know, provide aromatic remedies for them. And so it was a really like live experience. But then Unfortunately, (laughs) due to COVID this Mm -hmm. year in 2020, when um, Governor Cuomo shut down New York City on March 15th, my business had to close. And I made a really, uh, you know, it was hard to to face the fact that it might Mm -hmm. be totally really over. Took me a couple of months to kind of swallow that. But then when the city started to open up in May, I really just said, you know what? I don't think even if I reopen it needs, it can be the same thing anymore. So I shut down the school and um, I just relaunched my new platform, which is amygalper.com, which really features my books um, my, um, I'm going to be launching a podcast in January and really my work as a clean beauty product developer and aromatherapist. And that's really what the focus of the website is, is really trying to demystify and deconstruct all of the terms swirling around in the internet and, mm-hmm. you know, and within the industry, like what is can be clean beauty? What is green beauty? What does natural mean? What does organic mean? Like, why is it important for their skin and uh, body care products are safe. What does it matter? And, and what's the difference between an essential oil and a fragrance and what's a nature identical and like, you know, all these questions. Mm -hmm. So basically, um, that's kind of the focus of what I do. And I launched a book, um, in 2018 called, uh, plant powered beauty, uh, with, uh, one of my former students, Christina Danio, she and I co-wrote the book together. It's been a huge hit. It's called Plant Power Beauty. You can find it on Amazon. And then just today, actually, we launched our online 
um, plat we uh, la launched our online class our, uh, of Plant Power Beauty. So we're actually doing an online program where we bring to life eight modules and 15 of our recipes from our book. And um, we're really excited. Uh, today is November 16th, 2020, just so people who are listening maybe later and say, oh, it just launched today. Well, it launched in November, 2020. Mm -hmm. And we're really excited. So uh, I'm doing that. And then, uh, yeah, and then I'm also gearing up to launch um, some more aromatherapy focused classes, as well as classes having to do with clean beauty product development. So that is um, kind of what I'm up to. Yeah. And I'm, I'm sure you can keep yourself busy because I, um, I'll tell you in 2003, I was eight and, um, I didn't know what this world would look like. Um, I guess at this point, but it's so interesting to talk to you who's had, you know, experience in aromatherapy when I didn't even know what it was. And I'm sure you've seen all these changes that have happened in the industry. And I, I even know just now from my marketing classes in the school, how much, you know, internet and social media has, has changed things. And for so many businesses and small business people, it's, it's helped. It's just like launched their careers and things like that. But it's also now become kind of a dangerous way to base all of your product buying decisions off of, because there are a ton of, you learn this in marketing school, there are a ton of different ways in which to convince somebody to buy your product and maybe not necessarily in the most honest ways or with some I guess uh, less than ideal marketing tactics um, and I'm sure you've since you're like a champion of the clean clean beauty industry and in that aspect and how you've seen you know it's it's changed and maybe even become a little bit dangerous in the sense that um you know, businesses are using words like natural um, and not really going into any details of what that terminology means and how, you know, you're trying to be somebody who's uh, responsible, I guess, in educating people on what ingredients are in projects. And I just want to, to kind of see what you thought about how our new marketplace has changed the industry. Oh, hundred percent. And especially too, I think when I started out in this world, right, there were words like, as you said, natural, there were words like green, there were words like eco-conscious or eco-beauty. Mm -hmm. People were using terms like chemical free, toxic free, mm -hmm. non-toxic. You know, there were so many words being like tossed around. And now there is a new word on the block, clean beauty, which mm -hmm. really kind of, I think, totally shifted the paradigm and completely changed the conversation. And clean beauty, um, I believe, and even from talking to various beauty editors of whom I'm in touch with um, and other influencers and thought leaders in this very, uh, I would say, impactful market sector, clean beauty is only going to get bigger and bigger and it's growing faster and faster. And it is quickly over, like, I guess, bulldozing over all those other more ambiguous or perhaps mm -hmm. we could say untrustworthy terms like natural or mm -hmm. green. Gimmicky. Or That's how I think about Gimmicky. it. Gimmicky. It really exactly. Mean anything, but it, it, it does tells sense. you something. <laughs> exactly. And what clean is really doing. Um, and I think Credo Beauty, um, I am on their, I am part of their Clean Beauty uh, Advisory Council. Uh, Credo Beauty, just to give a little, uh, if anyone doesn't know about them, they really are the pioneers of putting together a, a kind of uh, skincare and color cosmetic marketplace, like in physical boutiques they had prior to the pandemic, as well as a very robust and interactive and pretty, you know, powerfully sophisticated website on mm -hmm. 
uh, skincare, body care, color cosmetics that are all based on plant ingredients and what are called safe, cos- uh, safe synthetics. And, um, and safe synthet- synthetics that are based on green chemistry principles. So this is really one of the most, I think, uh, powerful uh, retailers that are out there that are truly kind of making an impact and 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 you know getting mm-hmm. people excited about this whole new movement. So when you look at the word clean beauty, so maybe what does it mean and why is it different than natural? So what clean beauty really is, and this is really coming from uh, Mia Davis, who is a pioneer within the the environmental safety and and safe product kind of industry. She worked in environmental group for a while, EWG, et cetera. And she's the director of mission over at Credo Beauty. And from working with Credo Beauty and working with the brands and the Credo Advisory Council, really coming up with a definition that looks at clean beauty as kind of this, as Mia says, a nexus, a, a connection point, an intersection of not only um, having a consciousness of where the products are coming from and really borrowing from the whole farm to table movement in food, right? Hmm. We see this huge, mm-hmm. um, this huge push of saying, okay, we want to know where our food comes from. We know that minimally processed ingredients, fresh ingredients, farm fresh ingredients are better for our health than highly processed ingredients. We know when Mm -hmm. we read the label on food in the market and we see the first three ingredients being sugar or salt or things that are fillers that are actually not new, you know, nutritious, we think twice perhaps about buying that product. And we need to apply that same logic when we are looking at our products that we're putting on our skin, meaning that we want to be able to know where our skincare ingredients come from and not Mm -hmm. only where they come from, but really be able to, if we wanted to call up the company and say to them, what is that journey that that jojoba oil took? Where are you farming Mm -hmm. it? How did it get extracted? How did it get stored? What was the shipping, you know, et cetera. And then understanding that whole journey from literally from seed to counter and being able to be accountable and hold our brand owners accountable for sharing authentic and true information with us. So I think that's one thing that's very important. And then also emphasizing that, you know, trying to find ingredients that are um, either plant derived, plant based, plant inspired, but understanding that it is from plants where we can find all of the phytochemicals that we might be wanting to work with. Um, And then also looking at issues of sustainability and farming practices, Mm -hmm. and even going as far as reaching into the culture of the brand, meaning that, you know, that the brand, if they are embracing, uh, you know, values like community, authenticity, um, honesty, transparency, that those values need to be reflected in the culture and in the company workplace as well. Um, and that these are values that, that, um, that ripple, <laughs> you know, yeah. beyond just, you know, what is on the ingredient deck. And, well, and- the part of the marketing, I guess, and some of the changes is that nobody can just sell you a product anymore. There's products everywhere. We, we're overwhelmed with how many things we can buy. What people look for is beyond a product. You're, you're selling a story, a purpose, a person, um, a place of something mm-hmm. that's not necessarily just comes in that package that you use, but it, it's always so much more than that. And that's how you develop relationships with people beyond buying your product because if I just get on social media now I can probably buy five things in a row from brands that I don't know anything about and I'll I'll, if I don't like it if I don't like them I'll I'll just never look them up again I won't even remember the name of the store I got them from but (laughs) if I if I liked everything else they did I will you know I'll follow that account I'll I'll post things I'll tag them and stuff I'll want to feel like I'm part of their family (laughs) Oh, a hundred percent. And I think it's interesting you're bringing that up because I think right now 
the culture that is now in the throes of this pandemic and the stress that we just came off of with this election and the uncertainty of our future for everybody. Mm -hmm. And this is like a world, we're all feeling this around the globe that I think people are looking even more so um, is, is that you know, we want to create community. We want to know that whoever we're buying from or whoever we're connecting with is that we are in it together and that mm-hmm. we are here mm-hmm. together and that we care about things and we share values and we share um, all these things together. So I think that this is another really important aspect Um, of clean. So clean therefore reaches way beyond just the ingredients that are on the label. It's really about brand culture. It's about, you know, community. It's about farming practices. It's about methods of extraction and methods of delivery. It's about so many other things um, that it's really kind of asking everyone to kind of just pay more attention, so to Mm -hmm. speak, to what they're putting on their bodies, where it's coming from and the impact of what that is. So um, I think that's why clean beauty is really here to stay. Yeah. I I think that's happening. I, I know so many people that, you know, have no people and I I say this as a younger person invested in aromatherapy now I have a lot of friends that are just haven't found their way to it or you know are aren't haven't been I guess as lucky as fortunate as me to have all the resources at my fingertips for it but they still find I still find them investing in wanting to do better for their skincare wanting to put better foods in their bodies wanting to to have like more and I say like uh, be more in touch with like their their mind body and soul and um I think one of the ways they can do that is like something they do every day is skincare clean my face maybe they'll apply makeup but they want to know that their makeup you know is uh, certain chemicals are free it's not just like some cheap glitter that they found on the shelf but it's like something that you know, they, that the person who created it invested in not only the containers that they bought it from that are like compostable or whatever, but, you know, all the way down to the, every drop of ingredients that went into it. And we find each other sharing brands that we've like, not only had a good relationship with, but I share brands that I'm like, also, did you know, like they're super environmentally conscious. They think about like climate change and sustainability. And so I'm selling them the brand itself. I'm not just like, this is a great product. I'm like, think of, look at all the other things that are with it. And I think the clean industry really has, has emphasized those other aspects to it because Mm -hmm. that's the people who look for it, or that's what they want to look for. They want to look for all the way through from production to getting the package is that it it met their standards of like morals and values. Mm -hmm. 100%. Absolutely. And you know, what's so interesting about what you're saying too, is where I'm seeing the, the circle kind of, I guess, closing or not closing, but just connecting is, is that this desire, right. To pay closer attention to what we put on our skin and what the brand's values and missions are, is also very important for us both individually and collectively to really Mm -hmm. understand about what it means to be healthy and to be well and to what our well-being is. And especially now during the pandemic when we are really trying to keep ourselves healthy (laughs) and well and Mm -hmm. take care of ourselves. And really for those of us who maybe never ever did one self-care ritual ever, (laughs) now suddenly we're like, oh my God, I need to like, you know, relax tonight and do take a bath an aromatherapy bath, or Mm -hmm. I need to do something to kind of take care of myself. I think this is now really top of mind for people. And what I'm seeing a beautiful connection is that the clean beauty market and certainly the brands that are embracing these values, this has always been a core pillar of what they do, that connecting Mm -hmm. beauty with wellness is, is vital to what 
we're understanding that, that beauty is not just a cosmetic application. It's really a lifestyle mm-hmm. and it's really a, a, a connection to what well being is. And so mm-hmm. I see that happening as well. And, um, and I think, you know, people that want to kind of break into the really excited about creating clean beauty products and stuff, they, you know, they might kind of feel overwhelmed about the options that they have and the responsibility that they have too to make sure that what they're saying is in their product is in it. And I'm I'm wondering if you have like advice for people who are wanting to start product development and who might be like overwhelmed by this terminology in the industry as a whole, um, especially with, and it comes to sourcing responsible products. Yeah. Um, check out, uh, Credo Beauty, uh, on social. They often do a lot of really interesting Facebook lives and Instagram lives, interviewing different brand owners, talking about different ingredients. Um, I know my podcast coming out in January will be a great, will be a great resource where I'm going to be talking to not only farmers, but also beauty editors and brand people and ingredient suppliers, cosmetic chemists, et cetera, within this space. So I think you could definitely find some things, um, different podcasts, but there's some really great resources online, like, um, uh, and we'll include them, I guess I'll share them with you, Savannah, yes. to put in the show notes, um, certain like um, professional trade magazines like Happy mm-hmm. or GCI or Cosmetic Executive Women, um, the Indie Beauty, uh, Indie Beauty Expo has a really great uh, resource center. Um, the Indie, I think, Indie Beauty Network also. So there's some really nice resources for people to look in that direction. And then as far as finding ingredients and sourcing ingredients, um, I know my my book, our book, Plant Powered Beauty, has a great resource sen- uh, section in that. And then um, certainly through my website, I'll be putting together some resources as well. Um, but, uh, I think those are probably some good places to start and I'll certainly share with you like some websites of where I think are for some trusted suppliers of ingredients for sure. Yeah. I definitely get, um, a lot of people who, who've, you know, discovered aromatherapy and in similar ways discovered aromatherapy and how, um, a lot of their skincare products have, have maybe failed them because they, they, compared the aromatherapy products to like the synthetic fragrances and then they looked at other ingredients and so they're like oh my goodness I can't believe I'm doing this and then they start to going to to DIY kind of formulations mode um and Mm -hmm. I I was wanting to get your take on you know somebody who who has a little bit of exposure to aromatherapy and you know clean products um versus like should they should they feel empowered to continue to make their own DIY products? Or do you even recommend that, you know, that they should just instead like look for brands or I guess, how do I want to say this? Um, If you're wanting to start development, like, should you start like you had in your kitchen making your own products like that? Or should they look to building, um, I guess, like an established manufacturing type process to go through it? I think it's always good to start anything with baby steps and get proof in the marketplace and get proof, you know, of how people are responding. So I think DIY is a great place to start. Excellent, Mm -hmm. excellent place to start. And I think that if this is a topic that really interests you, there are so many amazing things that you can make in your kitchen using, you know, fresh plant-based ingredients, even just straight from the farmer's market. So um, I think that is really a great place to start. And that was really the intention behind our book, Plant Powered Beauty, is we really wanted to empower people who the exact people that you're talking about, Savannah, like someone who's Mm -hmm. like really fascinated and excited by plant ingredients. They maybe have a small collection of essential oils are not totally sure how to use them, but they want to start incorporating them, you know, so you don't need to be Mm -hmm. certified to make stuff in your 
kitchen. You don't need mm-hmm. to, you know, be, have like all this intense education. I think you need to just like kick that to the curb and just get brave and just go in there into the kitchen and just start mixing stuff up. I think that's the best way to learn. And our book, like I said, is really for that person. We give really simple, easy recipes, you know, or th- we're measuring things in teaspoons and in tablespoons. We're not asking you to buy a fancy scale and weigh things out mm-hmm. and do complicated, you know, percentage formulations. This is not like some kind of cosmetic, you know, chemist course. It's really <laughs> about the intention is for those people who are making the switch to more plant based based ingredients to give them the confidence and the um, tools to be able to grab an avocado or pick up some avocado oil, touch it, smell it, mash it, use it, read about its different therapeutic properties in our book and understand why this is such a good ingredient for our skin and our hair. And then just like take it from there and just getting to know the ingredients I think is the best first step you can do is just start playing with them, smell them, taste them, use them. Mm -hmm. And then as far, and the same thing with the essential oils, like even if you're not an aromatherapist and maybe you have no interest in becoming certified, the best way you're going to learn about using essential oils, right. Is smelling them, sitting Mm -hmm. down Mm -hmm. and smelling them (laughs) and making a connection with how it makes you feel and then adding one or two drops to a product that you make and just always making sure that you use very, very little, keep the dilution or the amount super, super small and Mm -hmm. just start working with them. That's the best way to get connected to them is to just be in relationship with your ingredients. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's funny that you mentioned that because just the other day I was, I went into, I was like kind of having a stressful day and I was like, I know I need to do some stuff to make some blends and get this going. But I was like, I just don't know where to even start. And I just went into the room and I was there for like an hour and my husband walks in and he's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm just, you know, smelling the oils. It's like the first (laughs) part to any, any kind of, I just, yeah, getting my mentality together so I can do stuff, but also just, Mm -hmm. you know, being there and, feeling like I get to know them, Um, which is, it sounded silly when I said it out loud, but I was like, but it's important. Like, it's so important to the process. Um, hundred percent, hundred percent. I'm, I'm kind of curious because, um, you know, I get a lot of these questions a lot and just with, with what I do with Naha is I'm, I'm not, I'm not necessarily the one as the aromatherapist, but, um, I get a lot of questions about the regulations that go into making products for selling mm-hmm. specifically mm-hmm. in skincare. Do you, um, do you have like some of the ideas of the regulatory bodies that some people might have to go through if they wanted to start selling skincare? Well, yes, but there are no regulations. <laughs> the <laughs> FDA <laughs> does not regulate our cosmetic products and aromatherapy products fall under the cosmetic laws. So what that means is there are no rules about what you need, how you need to make them or whatever. Mm-hmm. However, there are rules about how you label them. And those mm-hmm. are actually... Um, governed, I guess, or overseen by the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission. And they actually do look at labels. And they actually do make sure that if you, that you need to disclose on your label, everything that's in your product. So that is something that they definitely look out for. And then also what the FTC looks out for is that if you are making a cosmetic product, you cannot make what's called a structure uh, function claim. You can't say this will, you know, uh, heal or get rid of your acne. So you can't mention any physiological disorder or condition or system, and then use words like heal or cure or any kind of medical terminology, like things like, you know, my, uh, this chest salve is an, is a mucolytic and expectorant. 
Like you can't use language like that. So any product that we use on our bodies fall under the cosmetic laws and labeling laws. And those are easy to look up by just going, you could just Google FDA cosmetic regulations and read actually the long, long document written by the FDA about how you need to describe and market your products. Um, the other thing that is also very important, even though there are no quote regulations, really, if someone is making products in their home, they need to be held accountable, meaning that if they make a hundred different body butters and they sell them at the farmer's market or whatever, and then they start getting like a ton of emails saying, oh my God, it made me you know, made me break out. It made me have an itchy rash. It made me, gave me a skin infection, God forbid, or whatever it was. They need, you need to be able to have excellent record keeping in your own filing. So then if that person were to call you up and say, your product gave me a rash, you would then say to them, what product did you purchase, what was the lot or batch number on your label. So it's really important that you batch and number your products. And then you go and you look up in your file and you say, oh, I made batch number XYZ on November 10th, 2020. And oh, look at that. I used my ho-ho, I used my almond oil, but it was really close to an expiration date, you know, and then you can kind of do the detective work on what may have triggered that response in that person. Mm -hmm. And so it's really about um, rather than fall, like feeling like you're getting in trouble by the government, you really need to be accountable and take really good record keeping of everything that you're doing. And then also making sure that you are completely transparent on your labels. So those would be the two things. Um, and then also not using language that um, uh, at all uh, suggests any structure or function changing yeah. in the body. And that's super helpful. Cause I know that, you know, it's sometimes unclear. Like I get a lot of questions about the regulations for the industry in general. And that's the thing you're like, well, there aren't any, but there's a lot of irresponsible ways you can go about that. And that's mm -hmm. not what we want to do to protect the integrity of the field in general, aromatherapy, natural skincare, or plant-based, a uh, clean skincare. That's, that all falls under even if it, there's no regulations, you, you have a responsibility to uphold the, the integrity of the industry for others so that, you know, your, your work and products aren't nefarious and, um, mm -hmm. yeah, so we can, we can grow it. And, um, I, I do think that leads me to ask though, you know, there, there are regulations about labeling things as organic. Like you said, you had to get to the USDA logo. Um, mm -hmm. and I just wondered if you wanted to take a minute to kind of I guess paint a clearer picture about like words like organic, natural, plant, plant-based and clean um, and how to use those responsibly and legally. Okay. Well, organic is really the only term that actually has legal ramifications because it is controlled by the FDA. So if you want to use the word organic on your skin and body care product, it has to follow certain rules that have been put forth by the FDA about understanding what organic is. You can also find this on the FDA site. You just need to Google FDA organic labeling and you can come up with all the rules. But primarily the organic labeling laws, I think are three tiers, um, meaning that if it is 95% or above organic, like the ingredients are actually certified organic, then you can carry the USDA organic seal. So that means like when you go to the grocery store and you see avocado oil and you see the organic seal on it, you know that that is 100% organic avocado oil. And it is by the law, they had an organic inspector go there and make sure that the avocados were processed, were grown in organic soil and grown in an organic way. Um, the other level is I think 70% organic. And 
in that instance, you cannot put the seal on your product, hmm. but you can say on your label, this is 70% made with organic ingredients. And then you can list the organic ingredients, but the other percent, I believe, and it's been a while since I've looked at the law, at the regulation, but I believe then the other ingredients need to be part of what's called the NOP list, the national, the national uh, organic program uh, uh, list uh, where it's the a national or I think organic product list. Um, and this is uh, a list of products that you can use, like ingredients that you can use to fill that other 30%. Oh. And then there is, um, so I think those are the two major ones. And then what other people do, um, because getting that organic seal um, is difficult. Um, difficult in that it's really hard to formulate a very effective and stable sh uh, shelf stable product that is 95% and above organic. You can easily do it with an anhydrous, meaning with an oil or wax or butter based product. And, um, but certainly like things like emulsifications that use water and oil or even um, gels or cleansers or things like that, that um, is a little harder to do at a hundred, you know, at that 95% or a hundred percent organic. Um, so what a lot of companies do is you can list your ingredients in your ingredient deck, put an asterisk, and then say, this is a certified organic ingredient. And that's what a lot of um, brands do now is they call out which ingredients on their deck are actually certified organic, rather than go through that whole process of getting the product entirely certified, unless they feel like they really could. Now, in my case, right. when I did my products because I was making an herbal salve, which was a, an, you know, an aromatic herbal salve, which was a, uh, anhydrous products. I was able to get the hundred percent, um, USDA organic seal because I used beeswax that was certified organic. And then all of my oils, um, my carrier oils were all certified organic. And then also all of the essential oils that I chose, I made sure to choose certified organic essential oils. So every single ingredient in my product had its own individual organic seal. And that's how I was able to get the overall seal for the product. Um, so organic is legally established. If you use the word organic on your product, the FDC can come after you and say that you are not using it correctly and you have to take it off all your marketing because you actually are not organic. You can actually get in trouble. And I've known people who've gotten sued for using that word. Wow. Um, natural is very similar. Natural, when you look it up in the dictionary, means it literally comes from nature. Like literally, this is salt it's bubbled up from the earth. This is salt. It's natural, right? I'm not mm -hmm. changing it or doing anything or clay. It's like natural. It's right there. Okay. But there's things like soap, right? Like Castile soap, cold processed soap. Yes. You know, it's started out as a plant-based plant -based ingredient, but actually it's not natural because it had to go through a chemical process to become soap, right? It had to go through the process of saponification before it could become soap. So we can't really legally, I mean, you could marketing say that it's natural, but if someone were to bring you to court and say, prove to me that this is natural and they're abiding by the definition from uh, the dictionary, the common definition you would lose because soap is actually mm -hmm. not natural. It doesn't exist on its own in nature. And again, unfortunately, I know brands who have been sued for this, that they had a savvy <laughs> customer who challenged them and said, hey, I just read your ingredient deck. You're saying that it's 100% natural. It isn't because I know this ingredient 
was actually derived from a chemical process, maybe using plants, but itself does not exist in nature and they can get in trouble. So um, that is a, a word that can be very troubling. Another mm -hmm. word is um, you mentioned like green or eco or really just uh, marketing terms that can be mm -hmm. used really have no weight at all. And clean, I guess you could say is definitely a marketing term, but it has a lot more weight because um, the term is now being trademarked. It's people, they, Credo Beauty has actually come out with um, a whole big pot, uh, stack of standards because there are no standards in the industry for beauty. Right. right. There's no rules. Oh. It's totally not regulated. So there are no standards as far as what clean beauty or natural beauty or any of those words mean. So Credo took it upon themselves to create standards. And you know who else did that also is Whole Foods. Whole Foods put together their own standards. So any brand that wants to sell in Whole Foods, they have to make sure that they are totally aligned with whole foods standards. And so just like we're seeing in the aromatherapy industry, right, where there's no like governmental or agency that is establishing like what is an aromatherapist or how many education hours does someone need to have before they call themselves, it's really dependent on the professional associations to set forth the educational standards mm -hmm. about what aromatherapy is. This is what's happening within the clean beauty movement. The clean beauty is saying, hey, look, we are sick and tired of these words like, you know, natural, green, eco being tossed around with people not really trusting it. We're going to create standards that people have to abide by. And yes. so that's kind of what uh, Whole Foods has done and what Credo Beauty has done. And right. because I work with different clients who work with different contract manufacturers and different cosmetic chemists, um, Credo Beauty standards are now becoming um, like the gold standard, put it that way, that uh, people can actually, I see it now, I see on websites for contract manufacturers and, and cosmetic chemists, where they actually brag and say, we follow credo standards, we follow a whole food standards. And I think this is an amazing leap forward, because uh -huh. before, people weren't doing that, you know, and I think that, uh, that clean beauty is really at the forefront of helping to set forth these very important standards. And that's really exciting because I'm trying to be like, words mean something. So you can't just say natural and it not actually mean it. Like it means something. <laughs> so exactly. hundred um, percent. It's so um, exciting to see, you know, there's always that, I feel like, you know, throughout like consumer life cycles of products and product marketing, I guess, um, marketing ideas, there's always that lag of, okay, there's this new and exciting thing. And then now we have to standardize it. Okay. And so it like, it, it seems like it runs amok for a while until somebody comes in and says, actually, like, you know, we, we should put rules to this. So people like trust it and trust that when you say it's mm -hmm. a clean beauty product that meets these standards that you can go to that website and be like, what are your standards? And I think exactly. I even tell you, people that call and they're like, you know, what, like, what does it mean to be a certified aromatherapist? I was like, I, you know, a certified aromatherapist and a Naha certified aromatherapist are differently. If you're a Naha certified aromatherapist, it means you meet our standards. And that's like what we try to do for the industry, because um, we know that there's, there's this lag that people are discovering and learning about aromatherapy without necessarily like a, a streamlined approach and so you you hear all these different things and you want to figure out like what's what can I trust and that's that's where that comes in and especially for a lot of these industries that aren't you know regulated so much so by the government but that's okay then we we need to put somebody that we trust in charge of it at least or some organization that's grouped together by people within the organization who have been there for years so that's exciting yeah, no, I think it's very exciting. So perfect. Well, yeah, Amy, sure. um, we're about out of our time today, but um, you definitely taught me a lot about the skincare industry. Um, just I knew I knew some of the insights and I see enough of it, but um, I definitely um, think our listeners will be excited to hear 
especially the ones who are wanting to break in and excited to hear about all of your educational tools that you know you have available and you're going to continue to make available and um, I know we'll be sharing a bunch of links later on but please tell us just a little bit more about some of the things you have upcoming that people can look forward to. Yes. Yeah, so um, as I mentioned, this week, we just launched our Plant Powered Beauty course. This is really a class. This is really for the newbie DIYer, someone who's just starting to make products at home and just starting to learn about plant, like plant ingredients and make products with them. There's a really nice chapter on essential oils and aromatherapy. Um, if you are a certified aromatherapist, level one, level two, level three, maybe some of the material might be a little redundant because you're probably used to making products for your clients. Um, so this is a little more, I would say more entry level course. Uh, my website, amygalper.com is going to be having a podcast. It's called clean beauty Wellbeing, which will be about a lot about what Savannah and I were talking about today. Um, and then my book that I co-wrote with Christina, um, Plant Power Beauty, you can find it on Amazon and Barnes and Noble, et cetera. And then um, there is a, let's see here. Um, I'm going to be launching a couple of other cl classes, online courses in January, but I also do every week, though I'm taking two weeks off now because of Thanksgiving, et cetera. Um, but back start up again in December of 2020 and definitely starting up in um, January, it will happen every week. I do weekly live stream classes on different, um, I teach how to make different skincare products or different uh, essential oils. So I have a class coming up on how to make your own uh, foaming uh, hand cleanser coming up in December. And then I have how to make your own cream. And then I have essential oils for headaches, essential oils for good sleep, et cetera. So I'm gonna be doing these weekly live streams, which are really exciting. Um, and uh, you could check out those classes as well. And then just, you know, sign up for my email list to make sure that you are uh, in, you know, alerted every time a new course and an, anything new comes out. And uh, yeah. And I think that's about it. And, and then also we have a new book coming out also that just came out last week, The Ultimate Guide to Aromatherapy. Um, you could find that also on um, Amazon and Barnes and Noble. So I think that's it. <laughs> awesome. Yay. Well, yeah. And you, I mean, you put out tons of resources. I see it all the time. So yeah, she's a great go-to for anybody just wanting to learn a little bit more about aromatherapy in general, skincare. Um, and I think, you know, as a business entrepreneur, you've definitely set yourself apart and um, have have solidified like some expertise in that area. Um, and so I, I definitely look up to you in, in that capacity and um, think you're just, you're doing an amazing job. And I'm so glad we finally got to sit down and talk and um, yeah. COVID is a way to bringing people together. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Well, thank you so much, Savannah. This was so much fun. And anytime you want me back, I'm happy. So thank you so much for inviting me. Thanks, Amy. All right, everybody. See you guys next time. Thanks for joining us on today's episode of the Beyond Aromatics podcast. To learn more about Naha and all the things we do, check out our website at naha.org or follow us on social media on Facebook at Aromatherapy Community or on Instagram at Beyond Aromatics.